Happy Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor. Uh, lots of questions last week. Keep the questions coming in because they're really, they're really, really good. Uh, so let's go back and think a little bit about what's going on worldwide with COVID. You know, we're up to 6 million documented deaths, but if you look at excess mortality by the WHO, it's more like 15 million. So when you put it in the context of the Spanish flu that was 75 million, you know, 15 million is a lot less, but it's still the biggest uh, global pandemic and death rate from uh, infectious disease uh, in uh, 100 years. Uh, Europe is almost back open, you know. I mean, there is no restrictions on mask wearing or anything like that you know, when you travel through Europe. Uh, only the U.S. Is, is requiring a negative test upon return, which is kind of scary for those of you who travel outside the U.S. because you may, you may well be spending five days uh, hanging out to, uh, until you get a negative test. But tourism is booming again in Europe. Meanwhile, the Chinese are like doubling down on lockdowns in Shanghai and Beijing. So I have no idea what they think they're going to accomplish with that because they're not going to prevent the, the disease from spreading. And Taiwan, of course, uh, is taking the opposite approach, uh, trying to open things up. Interestingly enough, worldwide, the case rate is beginning to fall. This is the strangest little blip I've ever seen. When it was get, getting ready to go up, then it dipped down. But overall, the, in the world, the cases are down about 17%. I did a, a heat map for the U.S. and South America, so North and South America, the Western Hemisphere, April 15th and June 3rd. And you can see the U.S. and parts of like Chile and Argentina are actually going up in the Western Hemisphere. But if you look at what's going on in Europe and in the Far East, it's going down. So Europe was here April 15th and is now improving June 3rd. And the same thing for uh, Japan, Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, they're all going down. So that's what accounts for the overall drop. But the U.S. has actually been, been going up. Uh, we had an, in, uh, an increase of about 30% last week with 110,000 new cases. But, you know, it's really getting inaccurate because so many people are testing at home. It's really hard to know what the real case number is. So we're going to have to rely on other things like wastewater, for example, which we'll get to. Uh, regardless, the surge that we're having or the increase in case number we're having is way less than uh, the surge that had happened in January. Uh, we have about 25,000 people hospitalized now nationwide, 11% in ICUs. Back in January, we had 150,000 people hospitalized and 17% in ICUs. So, you know, while we're going up, it's beginning to level off. And here's the, here's the um, case rate graph for the U.S. And this is actually really encouraging. It was going up, but it is now plateaued. So I think that's probably all we're going to have for the summer is kind of this ongoing low level, but not as much as the giant surge we had with Omicron. And you can see that, I think, in the, the, the heat map of the U.S. Look how bad it was in January. I mean, we were just, the entire country was on fire. Then improved dramatically. But lately, if you look at the last week, the Northeast is a little hot, and also the Midwest and parts of California. And as I mentioned before, the CDC is getting better and better at following wastewater, which I think is probably going to be the most important thing. And the, the good news for my sister and all of her friends in New York is that most of the wastewater numbers are actually going down. And that precedes what's going to happen in the case number by about two weeks. And so I think that New York is going to continue to plateau and even fall. The real hot outbreak is actually in Illinois and Chicago, Wisconsin, uh, parts of Colorado and California. So that's where probably you're going to continue to see uh, an increase in case numbers. You know, the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation, our friends in Washington, uh, Washington State, they don't predict the bump up at all, you know, based on the current uh, numbers, although I think they're wrong. We are going to probably still see a higher level. The CDC, in contrast, is sort of suggesting that we will have sort of a low level throughout the summer. The good news for Texas is we're actually pretty good. Uh, if you look on the CDC website, you can actually go to the county, and this is what I recommended in the Q&A last week. Go to the CDC website. There's a little thing that says state and county, and you can see what your level of threat is, and that's what should determine your behavior. So we're low, and our friends in Dima County are low. Havaliners are wearing their masks and being good. Uh, but we're down below 20 cases per 100,000. Dimmick County is below 10 cases per 100,000. So you, if anybody wants to go visit Dimmick County, you can go without a mask. 
<laughs> say hello to my friends at Havelinas. But here's the problem. If you look at wastewater, this is the wastewater numbers for Houston. Uh, all green in February. As we were coming out of the Omicron surge, all of the wastewater was falling. Look at it now. In the inner loop, interestingly enough, it's still falling. All around uh, Harris County, it's going up. So I'm a little concerned we're going to continue to see a rise in uh, local cases. And this is one of the strangest things I've seen in a long time. This is the predominant variants that are, the CDC uh, does by gen genome surveillance. And you can see what generally happens is one variant becomes more infe infectious and over time replaces the others. And that has been what we've seen time and time again. Alpha being replaced by Delta, Delta being replaced by Omicron, BA1, the first version of Omicron being replaced by BA2, and then BA2.12 uh, replacing BA.2. What's interesting to me, and I can't really explain it, is the BA1 that was being outcompeted is sort of making a comeback. It's coming back a little bit. Now, this is really, really interesting. So it could be that there are parts of the country that there was just a lot, you know, they're just exposed to BA1, and so it, ex it expanded fairly dramatically. But I have a feeling what it means, and we've seen this, is that if you get infected with BA.2, it's not that great at protecting you from BA.1. And over time, especially as immunity wanes, it may allow BA.1 to come back. Now, I don't want, I hope that's not the case, but I, if we see a resurgence of the BA.1, then that means being infected with BA.2 is not protecting you against the other variants. So we'll just have to see. And, you know, there is some evidence for that. If you look at vaccination, we've talked about this before, very effective preventing serious illness, still eight times more likely to be uh, to die from the disease if you've been uh, unvaccinated. <clears throat> but in terms of getting infected, it's only about two times uh, better if you're vaccinated because the vaccinations don't necessarily protect you from upper airway infection. And, you know, a lot, I'm sure you experience this too. Many of my friends who've been vaccinated, double boosted, have gotten infected. Now it's a, you know, mild illness, three to five days, like upper respiratory, some fatigue, but, you know, <laughs> It's still, if we don't have a vaccine, this speaks to the why we need a pan-coronavirus vaccine. And so, to me, that's what the NIH ought to be focused on, the CDC, is keep working on a pan-coronavirus vaccine. And one also that is expressed in the upper airways and the, you know, it has an IgA response so we can reduce the infection numbers. So, uh, very importantly, there's a, a publication in the British Medical Journal that Lily wanted me to review this week. Uh, and she wanted a giant uh, shout out to Silja, the dog from the Helsinki airport. So in Finland, they've been training dogs to actually sniff, sniff samples from people who have swabs of their nose and their body. And they can distinguish a COVID negative from a COVID positive. And I thought, you know, this is, I, I said to Lily, this is ridiculous. There's no way that's going to work. <laughs> they, 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 they did it. They, they did a study. They had four identical sets, so four dogs were trained. Uh, they took uh, 114 samples of positive patients, 306 negative uh, samples so from patients who were negative by PCR. So these were all confirmed by PCR. And the dogs had a 92% sensitivity of picking out the, the positives and 91% specificity. As a screening test, it's better than the antigen capture test. I mean, who would have believed it? Now, Lily said, absolutely believed it. I said, there's no way. But the data are pretty good. So they're actually setting up these screens in the Helsinki airport. So if people get swabbed, they'll let the dogs uh, smell and figure out if they're positive or negative. So, you know, for a screening test, you know, it's not bad. I'm amazed. Yeah, one other minor thing, <laughs> the variants are different. So if you train the dog on one variant, <laughs> it, it can't detect the other variant. So I don't think it's going to catch on, Lily. Where are you? I'm sorry. Honey, I don't think it's going to be as much as you, she's hoping to get a job at the, I mean, that's the thing. She wants a job at the airport. It's not gonna happen unless you get better at screening. Uh, anyway, so a lot of questions coming in on these days on small, on, on monkeypox. So I, I, I wanna spend more time on COVID, but I, I think we have to address this issue because people keep writing about it. So, so monkeypox is, uh, you know, is a very interesting disease and you have to go back uh, to think about uh, uh, smallpox first. Because smallpox was, you know, a very damaging disease, very infectious with humans. 
Uh, and it was the first, one of the first vaccines. Uh, Edward Jenner in 1798 showed that if you could inoculate uh, humans with uh, cowpox lesions, the, animal, the cows would get these lesions on them, you could inoculate a human with that, which was the first sort of vaccine attempt, and it would protect you from, from smallpox. And smallpox comes in sort of two varieties, variola major, which was the one that was disfiguring and killed 40% of the uh, patients, uh, and then variola minor, which was a less, less serious disease with very little mortality, 1% or so. Uh, and the entire world, the WHO, undertook trying to eliminate smallpox. Uh, the, and it's been the only disease, actually, that has been eliminated uh, ever, infectious disease that was eliminated completely. Uh, and the last, uh, the last case of smallpox, uh, major smallpox, uh, variola major, was in 1975 in Bangladesh. And the last case of variola minor was in 1977 in Somalia. So then they waited two more years. There were no new uh, uh, recurrences. And in 1979, the WHO uh, considered, actually proposed that the, the disease had been eliminated. And uh, the World Health Organization declared it eliminated in 1980. So the reason that's important is we have not been vaccinated against smallpox since the 80s. Because the general sense is it's not around. There's no reason to do it. There is some ongoing debate because Russia and the U.S. both have the stocks of, of smallpox, and the U.S. keeps around enough smallpox vaccination uh, to vaccinate the entire country just in case there's like global terrorism or something like that. But the point is that you're, we're, we don't have vaccinations against smallpox anymore. So monkeypox is related, and that is the reason you get these monkeypox outbreaks. So it's a viral disease, very similar to smallpox, more like the smallpox of variola minor, in that it's not as serious. There's about 1% to 3% fatality, case fatality, uh, but it's much less disfiguring than, than smallpox. But you get a fever, a headache, sore throat and cough, uh, a lot of you know, systemic feelings, achy wakies and that kind of stuff, lack of energy, fatigue. And shortly thereafter, you break out in these lesions. And the lesions happen on, on your face, uh, arms, hands, uh, and they look a lot like the smallpox lesions. They're kind of, uh, I would show them, but it's, it's kind of X-rated. My, my sister does not well, look, do well when there's any kind of nasty kind of looking thing. So we're not showing them because of my sister. But th th there's been an outbreak. So the, the WHO has identified 257 confirmed monkeypox cases and another 120 sus suspected cases where the, the disease is not endemic. So normally monkeypox is, is in Africa, but when you start seeing it out of Africa, you go like, well, that's, that's really unusual. And the CDC has reported 15 cases in eight states. So normally, you know, there are in the African countries, you can see over 1,000 cases. They had last year, for example, 1,300 cases of uh, monkeypox and about 70 deaths from that. But there's no real concern that this will develop into a global pandemic, even though the lay press is talking a lot about it. it. It takes, you know, very close exposure, and it's not nearly as infectious like a respiratory virus. But the cases where, there, where they have been, uh, the states that have been ex cases are in California and Washington. But mostly these are two or three cases uh, of close exposure. And if you think about the non-endemic countries, you know, it, it has shown up in Europe and in North America. And the, the endemic countries are in Central Africa. And as I said, in Central Africa, they, they usually get over a thousand cases. So, you know, what should you be doing about it? Well, if you're a healthcare worker seeing these, we, they're recommending a vaccination. And there is a vaccine that has been approved for monkeypox for, for p people who are actually taking care of patients like this. And of course, if you had a, a, an exposure. So my sister said, well, what do I do? I said, well, don't hang around with monkeys. That's a, you start off with that. Don't hang, but, or, you know, it, animals that in the wild that, are, that have been sick or died, you know, if you're in a, in a country where it's endemic, uh, you'd avoid, you know, hanging out with <laughs> or touching it, dead animals. And, and the main thing is that, you know, just wash your hands. Make sure you're, if you're taking care of patients with monkeypox, it actually is very serious. Like they have to wear PPE just like we do with other uh, viruses. But... The main thing is it doesn't look like it's going to be that big of a deal. It is, it, has, it is a little unusual that it's in these various states, but my guess is it will be self-limited. Now, just a quick couple of updates on vaccines. You probably heard that uh, the CDC was recommending that, uh, uh, that kids between 5 and 11 
go ahead and get a booster shot for Pfizer. And so that has been the latest recommendation. And there is uh, the Moderna vaccine under consideration for children under five. People have asked, keep asking me, when is that going to be available? Uh, hopefully, it'll be available soon. It's going to be reviewed. Yeah. So anyway, I want to end this week with a giant shout out to uh, Dr. Huda Zogby, who is the 2022 recipient of the Kavli uh, Prize Laureate in Neuroscience. She's being recognized for two major discoveries. First, uh, she uh, discovered the gene for sp spinocerebellar ataxia. It's a progressive neurodegenerative disease. And then the second discovery of her part was the MCP2 gene, which is responsible for Rett syndrome, which is a developmental disorder, uh, generally of children uh, and mostly girls. She shares the prize with her longtime collaborator and colleague, Dr. Harry Orr, who's a professor at the University of Minnesota. So this is a really wonderful award, it recognizes her outstanding uh, contributions in the world of neuroscience and something Baylor College of Medicine has not had before. So congratulations, Huda. You well deserved and, and, and we're really happy for you. Anyway, have a great weekend. Uh, it's the beginning of the hurricane season, so be careful. And I uh, can't wait to see you.